So we've already met uh, Tasneem, and uh, thank you again, Tasneem. Ladies and gentlemen, please thank Tasneem for a keynote address. I'll take the opportunity to introduce, introduce our other panel members. Uh, first up uh, to my immediate right is uh, Michaela. Michaela Jeffries, the Acting Commissioner for the Anti-Discrimination uh, anti Commission of Queensland. Um, Michaela is, has a very interesting background. She's particularly uh, committed to ensuring the men mental and physical health of employees is prioritised and embedded in the culture of organisations. Uh, she's an extremely strong advocate for sport and physical activity, uh, being a tool for social participation, integration and inclusion. <coughs> she's got a, uh, a, a vast uh, uh, experience in, in particularly, and, and a background, educational background in criminology and criminal justice. She's also a group process facilitator and uh, an art of hosting practitioner, so engages in a fair bit of dialogue, I would imagine. Please welcome Acting Commissioner Michaela Jeffries. <laughs> to second uh, to my right is Joshua Griffin, who is the Diversity Inclusion Lead at SBS. And Josh, I was fascinated with this because um, as the, uh, the this diversity and inclusion lead at SBS, you're working uh, with the executive team to promote inclusion within uh, SBS's highly diverse workforce. And I think there's a lot of assumptions that when you're working in what is it uh, seems to be a um, culturally diverse or has a focus on cultural diversity, that there is diversity and inclusion within that, that organisation. But you're actually uh, working very hard to promote inclusion within your own organisation. So I'm sure you'll have lots to talk about there. But I know, Josh, that you firmly believe that diversity is only part of the equation and that many Australian businesses are missing out uh, by not placing equal focus on building inclusive team cultures. So um, a broader view of the subject. We also have Dr Jane O'Leary, who is the Research Director at the Diversity Council of Australia. Jane provides a range of research, advisory and consulting services to assist Australian employers drive business improvement uh, through successful diversity management. And uh, Jane's actually established uh, the Council's research function and worked with Australia's leading diversity employers to design and deliver diversity research, which is actually ahead of the curve, it speaks to the Australian context and drives business improvement and importantly leads public debate. It's great to have you all here. Can you please welcome our panel? We will have time to ask questions. As I said, there's a roving mic. Please uh, wait until the mic reaches you. Place your hand up and then wait till the mic reaches you. Uh, I. Um, uh, I will try to invoke the Twitter rule where possible, so if I kind of wave my finger about, you've gone over your 40 words, uh, but if you could do, help us out and, and keep, it to, uh, keep it brief. Uh, as the people are thinking about their questions, I might just ask each panel member, starting with McCall, and we'll, we'll work our way around. I guess it's an opportunity here to tell us a little bit more about the organisation that you represent today, what you're doing in this space, and, uh, and in particular, I'd be very, very interested in um, knowing from you, what would you advise as being the starting point? I know there's a, we've got a diverse range of people within the audience, but if you had to think of one big ticket item uh, that people should focus on uh, to progress this issue, what would that be? Thanks, Peter. So, as Peter mentioned, I work for the Anti-Discrimination Commission Queensland. So, we're the statutory body in this state that administers the Anti-Discrimination Act. Uh, we have kind of two primary arms. The first one is our, our complaints management team. So, they receive and assess and conciliate complaints of discrimination, sexual harassment, vilification and other objectionable conduct. Um, so that's a really important aspect of the work that we do because it provides that space and the voice for people who have been discriminated against to resolve their issues and, and have their story heard uh, in the presence of the, the respondent. So uh, often through that process they're looking for some outcome, whether it is um, redress of the issues, so getting their job back or um, righting the wrongs that have been done. But in a lot of cases um, most people are just seeking, like I said, to tell their story, have their voice heard and for the other person to understand the impact that that's had on them. 
So that's a really important, I suppose, reactive um, function of the Commission. But on the other side of our work, we have the proactive preventative functions of education and community engagement. So the education is everything from uh, helping people to understand their rights and responsibilities under the legislation through to the unconscious bias that has already been mentioned today and other um, education modules such as business benefits of diversity and inclusion. So getting people to understand that, that broad picture that it's not just a tick box of making sure you've complied with legislation, but it's a really, it's a bigger story than that in terms of embracing diversity and leveraging diversity. <coughs> And our community engagement function goes even further than that. So we work with organisations and with communities um, to help them create the space for the conversations to happen so they can interrogate whether it's organisational processes or um, community connections to get the best out of that diversity. So we do um, quite a broad range of things and probably more than most people would understand about the Commission. Um, and that gives us... Um, two things. It gives us the statistics about the complaints so we can get a gauge of um, what's happening in the community in terms of whether discrimination is reducing or increasing and in what areas. But the stories from the community are also that other part of the picture that really tell us what's happening that perhaps isn't captured through the complaints process because the complaints process isn't for everyone. Um, it's certainly a vital service, but it's not the only way to resolve these issues. So to your um, second part of the question, Peter, I'd say... The, f the place to start, in my view, with this is the stories. Telling the stories, listening to the stories, that adds that part of the equation that might not be evident just from data or the statistics. If you can understand the story, and Tasneem's story about Ewan, I think we'll probably all, re all remember Ewan for a long time. Uh, the stats that she quoted, I probably will never remember them, but Ewan is in my mind now forever. So I'm going to be picking Ewan's out everywhere. Sorry, Ewan. <laughs> So that's really important to connect people's head and their heart with the story of, of discrimination and diversity and inclusion and all the things we're talking about today. Thanks, Michaela. And I'd probably need to say, for those one or two Ewans who are in the room, you get an extra piece of chocolate cake at the end of the day. <laughs> that's, I think that's only fair. Is there, is there a Ewan? Is there a Ewan here? Or you probably don't want to identify <laughs> yeah, yeah, yourself? Yeah. Leave it, leave it. <laughs> Josh. Um, so as Peter said, uh, my name's Josh, I'm from the SPS, the Special Broadcasting Service. I'm pretty sure most people in the room have probably engaged with SPS at, at one point or another, uh, but I'll give you the spiel anyway. Um, so obviously we are a uh, media network um, and we're bound by a charter uh, to inform, educate and entertain all Australians and celebrate our multicultural uh, society. And, and we do that through, obviously, most people know uh, SBS, the TV channel. Um, we actually have a number of TV channels, including NITV, which is the um, premier, uh, premier um, Indigenous uh, television network. Um, and we also run a number of in-language programs. And when I say a number, I mean um, over 65. Uh, in language radio programs. We have our streaming service, SBS On Demand, um, and, and perhaps maybe you've just engaged with SBS when you're, when you're watching The Handmaid's Tale. Um, <laughs> and we do a ton of community engagement work as well. So, so we're out there in communities um, all the time. Um, we engage in uh, a number of um, mentor programs and things externally. Um, we work with screen agencies around increasing representation of people with diverse backgrounds in the production sector as well. So it's not just about what we do within our own business, um, but also around how we feed back into, back into the industry as well. Um, so diversity and inclusion, you know, as, as Peter kind of alluded to, is, is largely our kind of product or our service that we put out there. Um, but we're also really, really passionate and, and focused on making sure that as an employer, um, we're equally focused on being diverse and inclusive um, um, walking the talk, so to speak. Mm. And Josh, the starting point or the oh, general yes. advice? Oh, yes, I forgot the second part of your question. Yeah. Um, look, I, I think that the starting point always has to be with yourself, right? I think I think before before you're trying to enact change on a large scale, I mean, inclusion for me is around how you, how you interact with other people and it's actually remarkable the impact that a single individual can actually have on the experience of someone else. So I think the starting point, absolutely, and it's not the only point and I've got a, a ton of them to talk about, but um, the starting point I think is reflecting on yourself and, and reflecting on whether you're being um, as visibly or verbally um, inclusive as, as you possibly can be of other people and maybe that's as simple as just asking someone for their opinion where perhaps you might not have, have naturally been inclined to do so. 
can make a massive world of difference for, for someone else. Thanks, Josh. Jane. Thanks, Peter. Um, my name's Jane O'Leary. I'm um, Research Director at Diversity Council Australia. And for those of you who don't know, we're a not-for-profit peak body. We have, um, and we work with employers in Australia to help them create more diverse and inclusive workplaces. We have about 480 Australian employers who are members of ours. And one of the services we provide is research. So industry-based research on how what works and what doesn't when it comes to um, creating more diverse and inclusive workplaces and it's very topical because um, Tasman was saying about un unconscious bias uh, training and we just did some research that we released lately saying um, beware, beware, approach with caution <laughs> um, and so that's one Ooh. thing that I would um, sort of talk to at a later point is not to look for the silver bullet. There is no silver bullet and a lot of uh, companies sort of jumped on board with the unconscious bias training and we know from the research now that it has very mixed uh, results um, and there are better options and better ways you can spend your money. Um, but I love Josh's point about it starts with yourself and um, and so in if any of us are looking for something that they can do and they're not in a leadership position to drive change necessarily. You can drive change in the immediate interactions you have, as Josh said. And I think inclusive language, getting across inclusive language is a key way of doing that. And I know that that's a controversial topic. Um, DCA did a research uh, project last year with David Morrison, the Australian of the Year, uh, called Words at Work, and it gives guidelines on inclusive language across all diversity dimensions. And um, I think it's really powerful. Words have power, whether we like it or not, and they can act to include or exclude. Um, and I think a really clear example of that is just the phrase, where are you from? Um, and I'll, rather than unpack that, I'll just put that out there and um, pass on to Tasneem. Okay. Yeah, famous question. In terms, well, I've, you know where I'm from and, well, well Bendigo, uh, via Kenya. Um, but in terms of uh, what the, what are the two things that I'd bring um, or the thing that I would bring to the conversation if there was a takeaway, uh, that would be to include or press for, be that person who says in a meeting, every time you've discussed a program or a direction or an innovation, how have we embedded a cultural lens on this? So, for example, if you're promoting an event, if you're planning for an employee, got a new program coming out, has in the thinking and the structure and the deliberation of that, have you employed a cultural lens over that, which means are you mindful of the broader community and how they would be included in it? So just be mindful of your diverse communities who are consumers and who are participants and who are employees, and is their voice included in the broader picture? Thank you. I'm going to open it up to the floor now. I'm sure there are lots of questions. Uh, so again, in an orderly fashion, you'd like to put your hand up. And uh, the gentleman at the back there. All right. Uh, I'll try to uh, explain this uh, as short as possible. Uh, I just want to uh, give my experience in, in, in two, two areas. One is my own personal life and the other one is the department that I work, f work for. I've been working there for now 25 years. Uh, at the personal life, I have some of my best friends, some of my closest friends are Australians, I mean Anglo-Saxon Australians. Very, very close to them and they are very close to me. But I also come across a few who are rather racially biased. Now the way I deal with them is quite quite different, probably not to be recommended uh, to anybody else. <coughs> One is uh, direct confrontation by questioning, and that will change the attitude to to a large extent. Uh, I give an example. Uh, I meet this uh, this guy in the lift in my office. I meet him every day, and just they looked at me and uh, he doesn't even smile, just stare at me. And one day. He looked at me and asked me, what's your name? I said, I'm Derek. Derek? I said, well, then he asked me, from, from where are you? I said, I'm from Sri Lanka. How can a Sri Lankan get an English name, Derek? They have very long names. And then I told him, have you heard of colonialism? 
And before I went to speak about colonialism, he just left the lift. He went away. And ever since then, when I meet him on, in, the, in, the, in the lift, he gives me a very good smile. He's my friend now. So that type of questioning and confrontation, but I will not, for example, my wife and my child are much more submissive and gentle and meek. <laughs> I don't know how, how they will respond to a situation like that. Uh, number two about the department. Now, I doubt very much in our department there is a, there is a percentage of the gender bias thing. You know, we have very few females in the management level and also top level. And there's a genuine principle uh, policy that will increase the number of females to about 40% in, in the next uh, five to 10 years. There's no such percentage for, for racial equality. So I have worked there for 25 years. I doubt very much that that will be reversed. There'll be very incremental changes, but very doubtful. My question is, how will that impact my daughter and the children who are born here for my, to migrants? They are on the top, as you said. Uh, uh, they get, they take get op ones, op twos, and they are doctors and engineers and and economists. How will the situation continue, even into the next generation? And that will be a big problem if our children, who are doing so well ac academically, had to face the kind of discrimination we have faced. I don't mind living through rest of my life after retirement the way it is, but I'd be very worried if that is going to be continued into the next generation. Thank you. Thanks, Derek. Um, I always, at the beginning of a session, make some allowances for the first question. So there's a few tweets within that, but, but thank you. Uh, but, but very pertinent, I guess, taking it from the personal to the systemic and, uh, and then back again to the personal. I wonder if, uh, if any of the panel would like to respond to any of that. Um, I'm looking at Michaela. Um, I'm thinking about the work of the Commission. And I'm just Thank you for your multi-tweet question. I think um, targets and quotas are certainly part of the equation, but um, that, that's not the be-all to end-all. So you don't necessarily have to have targets to put that kind of thing on the agenda. I think it's about starting the conversation in, in the workplace and um, having the dialogue about um, is our organisation reflective of the community? I think that was mentioned a bit earlier. So you can still approach it without necessarily um, having the target. And um, by the time your children get to the workplace, I'm hoping that uh, things are already shifting. So I'm hoping that they will have shifted even further and they can um, find their place without having to hang, hang their hat on some particular target, but just be recognised for the unique skills and abilities they bring rather than necessarily being a number. So I'm not sure if that necessarily answers your question, but um, targets are certainly one part of the equation, but there's other ways of, of getting those things on the agenda. Can I talk to the target sure, Jack. question? We, um, one of the directors, board directors of DCA, Ming Long, is one of the few culturally diverse women who's been a CEO on, of an ASX company. And she has put out there for the last couple of years, and I love this idea of targets 40-40-20, she calls it. And so you look at gender balance for 40-40. And then you have um, a target of 20% in leadership for cultural diversity and or other um, key demographics. And I would really like us to go that way. And I, I know that targets are unpopular, so um, or quotas are unpopular, but I think targets is something that a lot of people are comfortable with. And I think in any sort of business, we never have a business strategy without setting a goal or a target to make ourselves accountable and see how we're tracking. And I think this should be no different. Thank you. Thank you. Um, other questions? Gentlemen at the back there. Thanks very much for joining us today, and I particularly appreciated in um, Tasneem's the report card that you gave for executives and boards, and the fact that that's quite poor. So my question is probably around for those kinds of roles where often it's not an open merit recruitment process. What can be done to disrupt to make sure that we are aiming for 40, 40, 20? Again, I don't think there's a silver bullet solution to those. Often, in, in my experience, it comes down to leadership within a board. And I, just, I think I've been very blessed to have been around um, what I can only describe as visionary leaders who actually saw the merit 
in having a board that was representative of a community. And that was the driver. So then, knowing that was the driver, the interviews and assessments were made against a target. But also the way in which call-outs are made and where you advertise and how you recruit, if it's to the same old, same old, you're only getting the same batch of applicants time and time again. So you need to widen the net. And so then it comes down to recruiting culture as well. Um, I know one of the organisations that I chair, we've been looking for a chief operations officer for some time. And uh, we were just advertising through the same, I don't, I don't know if it was some some online portal and we're getting the same applicants we had like five years ago. So then we decided to employ, retain a you know recruiting consultant. They widened the net and lo and behold, the applicants that we got, just, you know, 100% variance in what we had. So there's being bold and being creative in the way that we recruit, um, but then having targets within that recruitment of like, we do want to get 50-50. So until we get that 50-50, then we'll, then we'll appoint. So it's, and yeah, having great visionary leaders. And I'm, I'm, Ken, I'm speaking about Ken Lay here in particular. Uh, he's just been phenomenal in the way that he would actually say, we need 50-50 women and 50% male and female on this board. And Ambulance Victoria is that. It's one of the few boards where there's 50%, you know, gender. Culturally, diversity is getting there, but the gender started. But it's not about, and I do want to point this out, I, I remember being at a panel on women's leadership some years ago, and a comment was made, like, similar to the gentleman who said to a leading feminist on the panel, you know, we talk about gender equality and gender equity as a benchmark. What about cultural diversity? and getting that benchmark in as well. And she goes, well, that'll just have to wait. We're doing the gender stuff first. And I thought, <laughs> my God, that's what the patriarchs have been telling women for the last 60 years, and we're not, we're not taking it very well. So I think, it's, I think it's only fair that we approach both together. Yeah. Do you try to comment, Jane, or...? Don't feel you have to, but if you... you In know, terms yeah. of things to do, um, I'm a great believer lately in something called, from behavioural economics, called nudge, nudging. And I think what we have tended to do is over-rely on us as leaders and our capacity to um, remove the unconscious bias. And so we've all sat through this unconscious bias training and, and we've gone, oh, thank God. But that, now I know about that and I'm definitely not going to be biased anymore. And it doesn't work like that. We know that from the research. Actually, the research shows if you sit through a training like that, the chances are you're more likely to make biased decision making because you have this false confidence that you've sat through the training. So, um, so the... Um, the, with behavioural economics, it's about saying, look, we're all flawed, let's face it. So l instead of relying on changing people's minds, let's change people's change processes and systems. And a classic example of that is um, the blind recruitment. And that in itself it doesn't always work perfectly. There's the research out of Victoria that depends, you know, it's horses for courses. But the other things that you can do are things like um, if you interview at uh, just before lunch or just before the end of the day, you're more likely to make biased decisions. There's research that shows this because you're hungry and you're tired and you just want to make a decision and get out of there. And so you can actually diversify the shortlisting by match the timing that you schedule your shortlist. Another one is two in the pool. Uh, this is from Professor Iris Bonnet and she found that if you have someone from a culturally diverse background, just one in your shortlist pool, uh, statistically, on average, there's zero percent chance they'll get hired. That's whether there's like three people in that um, shortlist or eleven people, up to eleven people. If you make two, if you have two culturally diverse candidates in that pool, their statistically their chances of being hired goes up by seventy six percent. So this is you can make changes to systems which sort of nudge you towards um, less biased decision making. Can I just add one sure. thing? Because I'm a bit conscious that unconscious bias mm. has now become the new Ewan in this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, yes. I, I wondered when you were going to yes, jump in. Yes, <laughs> and uh, given it's one of our products, uh, I don't want you to think that it's completely useless. Um, so uh, the, the great package that ADCQ offers uh, balances the information about un unconscious bias and that kind of aha moment where everyone goes, oh, shit, I'm a feminist, but I didn't realise that the 
doctors, the doctor was a woman, you know, kind of thing. So we balance the, the um, educative side of it within the practical side of, okay, now you know that you might be a little bit racist, what do you do about it? And it's at a personal level, but also at a systemic level in terms of your workplace practices and those kind of things, and really just making people think about it. How can we, in the workplace, change our systems or, you know, nudge a few things so that we're less likely to be biased? We can't get rid of it altogether. Um, but we don't just go, wow, you're a little bit racist, thanks for coming, see you later. Um, it's, we try to work with people and it's an ongoing process. We can't, we, we can't just let you out of our training and go, well, you're fixed now, everything's good. Um, yeah, it, it's part of the equation, as I was saying before. So. Don't hate on unconscious bias and you and too much. I should say, in, in your defence, that we do unconscious bias training as well. But, <laughs> but um, So I'm totally there with you. I think it's more about... What people think it's a silver bullet and it's not. Yeah. We were asked uh, when we were uh, planning this panel not to shy away from controversy, so I'm glad we're not. We're not. But um, I, I want to actually flick to Josh. There's a bit of a segue here, Josh. And, and sorry, it looked like you were going to say something. So if you need to... Jump in at the moment, but oh, I'll, I'll be I'll be very quick. Okay, go, go. I, I know we said we weren't going to do this, but I just feel left out now. So, okay. um, I, I think we just need to be really careful when we're talking about um, you know, diversity hires that we're not having a conversation which suggests that they're not merit based. Um, and I think if we're having non merit based recruitment decisions, I would probably argue that that's not very good business sense. We might want to look at that, um, particularly when we're talking about boards hiring people with diverse backgrounds, thoughts. Um, perspectives and experiences in the world um, is a very purposeful thing. And so it's about shifting the paradigm about what we mean by merit. And so when we're talking about people who have really unique perspectives on the world and something to contribute at the board level, for me, that is a merit-based thing that gets looked at, along with, obviously, a, a, a bunch of other things. Um, but I think we just need to be careful because there, there, there does tend to be a... Um, there is conversation where, in particular in relation to gender, where if a company has implemented quotas and targets, um, you do hear this language around, oh, well, she only got the job because of, because of those quotas. Um, you know, women make up 50% of, of our society. So I think to suggest that there's not a bunch of amazing skilled women who aren't there based on merit, I think, is, is erroneous as well. Is there, though, Josh, is there a danger that, uh, and I ask this as a genuine question, is there a danger that the diversity of thought argument becomes an excuse not to look at... Uh, cultural diversity or gender diversity. Uh, you know, I've heard some, you know, we're, we've got great diversity of thought in our, in our white Anglo-Saxon male um, cohort. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look, I, I, I mean, I think, I think that's certainly... Rest look, the, argu the argument would be um, that the way in which people move through the world, the more, you know, and I hate using the word diverse to describe people because diverse refers inherently to a mix. Um, but people who, have, who come from different backgrounds do have a different way of, of moving through the world. So yes, you might have diversity of thought amongst a group of Anglo-Saxon men, um, but I think the, the scale to which that diversity exists is going to be different to if you have a, a mix of gender, of culture, of, of um, lived experiences. Um, I think it's particularly at a board and executive level, um, but actually at any decision-making level, um, the more diverse that mix is, the more, the more ways you can look at a solution or the more ways you can look at a problem, the better outcome you're going to have because you're going to have all the options out there on the table. So, yeah, absolutely. I'm sure there are companies that look at their, you know, primarily older Anglo-Saxon male board and go, yes, we're really, really diverse, diverse of thought. Um, I'd probably challenge whether that's necessarily true if they have a competitor that has genuine um, mm. diversity of thought. Thanks, Josh. I, I do want to come back to you, but I just might want to make sure that other people get an opportunity to ask questions. But, gentlemen over here. Daniel. Yeah. Okay, Daniel. Thank you, Peter. Um, Tasnim, thank you very much. I enjoyed uh, your, your presentation. Let me start a little bit broad and then I will narrow down. I won't take a long time, Peter. Um, I was listening to BBC a couple of, uh, of weeks ago and a professor in the UK uh, was, was asked a question and, uh, about the, the popularist way of life and the rise of popularism in the US and around the world. And then the professor said, the rise of populist way of life and culture is a big threat, or is going to be a big threat to the UK diversity and inclusion. 
oh, I start thinking about it in the way of Australia. Is our panelists, is that the same way we understand things in Australia? And if that is it, a leader like me, how, how do I deal with such a situation that comes, um, international events that might affect our, our diversity and inclusion? Thank you. I might direct that to Tasneem in the first instance, given that uh, you mentioned uh, Tasneem at the beginning. Yeah, I'm just trying to understand the breadth of the question. Are you saying, is populism the end of diversity? No, um, the gentleman was saying that populism is going to, af the rise of populism in mm -hmm. the US is going to affect UK diversity and inclusion. And my question is, is that the same way for us? Will it Will that rise of popularism affect uh, diversity and inclusion in Australia? And if that is the case, how do you help me as a leader to be able practically to manage uh, those international issues that affect our diversity and uh, inclusion? And Daniel, I, I would uh, think that many in the room would think that populism is a strong force within Australia, not just uh, from America or, or the UK. And so it is affecting the, the discussion and the dialogue on diversity. Oh, well, the first thing that comes to mind is having robust mechanisms and legislations in place to protect the integrity of, of diversity. And like the Charter is a classic example of terms and references that bind and protect the diversity that flourishes within a state. So I think if they exist, if they're embedded, if they're implemented and respected, they become measures against which populism can only go so far. That's my immediate reaction. Um, but again, it depends on how willing organisations are to commit to those charters. Like if it's a tick box exercise, or is it in fact an exercise that they actually action? So, time will tell. Jane? Thank you for the question. I think it's a great question. And it's one that at DCA we've actually been talking about ourselves. And um, I know that diversity and inclusion practitioners in Australia have experienced a rise in resentment and pushback um, that comes from popularism. And from my mind, there are two um, things that think things that leaders can do. And one is around fact check fact checking and this is why I love the ABC fact checks they're fantastic they had one this week about um, I think it was Muslim workers who were unemployed and some politician had made a sweeping statement and they went back and they did all this fact checking and put it out there and I think that's really important um, and, and that's really important because with popularism people want the sound bite they, and that's why Pauline Hanson and people like that are really popular and Trump because they have the sound bite. Um, and so we need to, um, that's why those fact, that fact checking is so important. And the other thing that I think is really important is explaining to people that differential treatment doesn't mean that it's un, that you end up giving unearned special um, privileges to people from culturally diverse backgrounds. So there is a real view out in the popular um, public that we live and work in a level playing field. And so if you start changing the system at all, all of a sudden you're giving these culturally diverse people, or your women or whatever the group may be, special unearned treatment. And um, we need to explain to people that the, the field isn't level and that's why we're trying to, that's what we're trying to correct. Um, someone I read the other day made this great quote where they said, uh, for majority members who are so privileged, often equality can feel like oppression. And I thought that's mm -hmm. so true and that's where popularism is coming from. Just, just one more thing on that and on the back of that, I've noticed one of the most effective ways of, of countering um, what you see as this rise of populism and bigotry when it happens is to call it out when you see it in, in very strategic ways. So, for example, tabloid TV has, has frequently been known to have panels of experts discussing a particular group, be Indigenous, be it Muslim, be it Asians, without representatives of those communities on a panel. So call it out. And it happened in a very strident way to Sunrise when they recently made their comments about um, stolen uh, children to take it from Indigenous homes and why they should be taken. No expert analysis at all, just the platform. 
because they had the platform, they make the comments, calling that out. When Sonia Kruger made her comments, which is now going to, to court as well, about believing Muslims should be banned from Australia because she was a mother or something. Um, again, she was called out on that because of the bigotry of her comments with no political expertise, no expertise per se, but all the platform. And I think one of the greatest contentions of being a minority um, or being a diverse person is that lack of platform and agency to articulate your point of view when you're constantly being negotiated, but you're not giving a platform to counter that. So I think that's why independent media, SBS, and other opportunities need to be leveraged more effectively to be that counter voice. I want to shift the uh, discussion just just sideways, slightly sideways, and I want to turn to, to Josh. Josh, I was really intrigued that uh, uh, you know you're 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 working with your executive team to promote inclusion within SBS's highly diverse workforce. So you've already got a highly diverse workforce. That's a given. Uh, but you're actually working on inclusion, and you know, as many in the room know, there's a there's a major dialogue now. We 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 continue today. Uh, there are differences between inclusion and diversity. Um, so, with your highly diverse workforce, what are the uh, achievements and the challenges you've faced in trying to bring about a more inclusive workforce? Um, yeah. So, look, I mean, I think I think um, calling out straight away, as I, as I mentioned before, you know, we have. We have a whole bunch of radio programs, over 65 in different languages. So, you know, I think it's fair to call out, and, and I have sometimes referred to it as, you know, SBS is like having the cheat codes on for diversity because obviously you can't have an Arabic 24 radio channel unless the broadcasters speak Arabic. And so there's a kind of product reason, um, you know, a, a, a um, pessimistic person might say that there's a product reason um, why we have a highly diverse workforce. But we also have. Um, 50-50 male-female, our top 100 leaders, 53% of them are women, our board is 50-50, our executive team is 40-60. You know, that's not a product, um, that's not a product-based um, statistic. And so I think I think we have made really, really purposeful efforts to, um, to talk about inclusion within the workplace. And as you say, diversity and inclusion are, are really, really different concepts. But even for people who really care, uh, genuinely care about this as a, as a subject matter, um, the topic of inclusion can be, can be quite confusing. And I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, who here in the room would say that they are an inclusive person? Of those of you who didn't put your hand up, who <laughs> instinctively went to put their hand up and then thought, this sounds like a trick question, I'm going <laughs> to suspect probably the rest of you. <laughs> when, we talk about, when we talk about our own inclusiveness, what we're actually referring to is, is our ability to um, either tolerate others or hopefully, more optimistically, our ability to accept others. Um, of course, the difference between inclusion and acceptance is acceptance is within you, right? And it lives up here. So you think to yourself, well, I'm a really inclusive or I'm a really accepting person, I don't care, I, I, I'm happy to work with X, Y, Z and, and I, I, think it, I think it's really great that we've got a culturally diverse workforce. The problem is if I'm someone who comes into a workplace and my lived experience has been one where I have felt excluded in the past, how on earth do I know that you're an accepting person inside of your head? And if no one says anything to me, and if there aren't visible signs, verbal cues, if the executive teams and leaders aren't out there actively talking about and promoting the fact that they care about this, that this is a value, that they live by it and they're taking action on it, um, then I have no idea. So you might very well be sitting there thinking, I'm super inclusive and this is a really inclusive workplace, but your lived experience might be very, very different from the person next to you um, because it's all up, it's all up in here. Mm. So. I think the, the work that we've been doing has really been, you know, with our executive team, has been an education journey around saying, yeah, we, we get it, we all care about diversity and inclusion. I mean, if, if you're working at SBS and you don't care about diversity, I'd, I'd probably question if you're in the right job, right? But that doesn't necessarily mean that we fully understand and appreciate what it is to, to build an inclusive, uh, an inclusive culture. So, um, and I've forgotten the question, I'm sorry, but it, but, but it is about... <laughs> yeah. I guess I was particularly interested in, I know that you've had great achievements in that space, but how, some of the internal challenges, perhaps if you're able to share them and uh, without yeah, yeah, betraying so too many confidence. Yes, now I remember <laughs> where I was going. So, so look, I think the education piece is, is, is absolutely one. Getting, getting people to actually understand and appreciate what, when we talk about inclusion, I mean, it's a bit of a buzzword. What, what are we actually referring to in terms of what do we want them to do? Um, but challenges are, you know, we talk about people bringing their authentic self to work, um, you know, and, and what do you do if someone's authentic self is a jerk? Um, what do you do if, what do you do if, if someone wants to 
bring their religion and their culture to work and it happens to be hostile to the LGBT colleagues that they're sitting next to? How do you create a, a culture where there is space for all of those people to exist and work together and, and, have, and have kind of mutual respect for one another? Um, and, and I'd say that certainly for us, the foundation work around... Um, around getting to, to the work we're doing in inclusion was ensuring that we had really, really strong um, grassroots built values that we spent a really long time um, refreshing and building um, and everyone in the organisation was involved in. Because ultimately that becomes a kind of behavioural markers that, that you bring behaviour back to and you anchor what's acceptable in the workplace. Um, so, you know, I think, I think when we say bring your authentic self to work, there is a kind of caveat around that, which is bring your authentic self to work um, caveat, but act in accordance to our values. And I think, you know, our role as an employer is not to thought police people. People can obviously think whatever they like, but in a workplace, they can't do whatever they like. We've probably got time for just one more question and then, yep, Elijah. Thank you very much. Uh, my question, or possible at testimony, you can take the first lead and then it will follow. Uh, we talk about diversity and inclusion, and often in the media and society, we find people who are advocates for diversity and inclusion are those who find themselves either their community or themselves a victim of exclusion. And that has created a sense of which people are saying it is them and us that mean those are people who are seeking diversity, we don't belong to them it creates that sense of division. And also it's shifted the thinking. It become unconscious, biased, antagonistic in the system. Now, what can we do? What strategy can, we, can you give us, or what advice would you give us to bridge that thinking and the line which has been drawn to make sure diversity and social and, and inclusion is a unified desire for all of us. It's like a philosophical twist. Um, I would say diversity and inclusion is, is, is about providing opportunities and platforms, I like platforms, for voices which are otherwise underrepresented. So it's not at the it's not at the you know expense of all voices. So you know my diverse voice being part of this panel doesn't mean I overtake it. It's about having an having an equal footing in a conversation that includes me, that it includes my perspective and includes that view. So I think a lot of it has to do with the intention that underpins your involvement in it. So if if you're getting on the diversity and inclusion bandwagon because you want to take over, that's Really, that's not how that's not how it works. You're not actually you're going to undermine the cause. You're not going to progress it for everybody. You're only going to turn yourself into a pariah. Um, but if you're actually in it because you want to make sure that your voice is represented, then I think that's sustainable. So it's it's to do with your intention, and it's it's about you know you're working in, in tandem with other people. So they're there to check you. You're there to check each other and check you're on the same page. So intentions are and checking your intentions are essential. A it's a great segue. We, we have almost run out of time, and I, um, I'm going to, going to lead in to invite all of the panel members. And I might, I know you don't want to dominate the discussion, Tasmania, but I might give you the courtesy of finishing, having the last word. But before we do, I'll, I'll start with um, Michaela and then move around the panel. I know the panel have had an opportunity to, and, and some of them many times for many months have had an opportunity to look at uh, the multicultural charter. And I think that philosophical question uh, that Elijah asked leads well into how, how, what are some practical ways that you, we can bring this charter to life in our, every, every, um, our workplaces? Thanks, Peter. Um, I think we all have a role to play in this. And as Josh was alluding to before, inclusion is an active process. So we can't just assume we have a charter, ergo we're all going to be inclusive and diverse and accepting of other cultures. So we each as individuals need to take an active role in, in pushing that forward and modelling that behaviour in our workplace, in our in our personal lives, ch challenging the people if we hear or see behaviours that are incongruent with 
our value statement, which is essentially what the charter is. So don't be ambivalent and don't just be a bystander. I'd say wherever possible, take that opportunity to give a voice to the conversation <laughs> about diversity and inclusion and, and really be active champions for, um, for diversity and inclusion. Thanks, Bacana. Joshua. Um, I think from a, from a business perspective, if there's one thing that, that uh, one language that all businesses speak, it's, um, it's uh, in dollars. Um, and I think the, the amount of research, compelling research that is, um, that is repeatable over and over and over and over again is that diversity and inclusion in combination um, enhance business performance. So um, whether you're in a leadership position or not, um, I, I would suggest that that is really compelling. I can't think of a business owner who, who wouldn't want to see their business performance um, increase. Um, the, other, the other really practical thing, this might sound really, really controversial, is if you've actually, if you have a, a board or an executive team who've seen all the data um, and actually make an active decision that this is not important to us, um, then I guess you know, my controversial uh, suggestion would be perhaps you vote with your feet. Um, because you know, I think I think particularly now in terms of uh, particularly in the digital age, um, you know, the talent wars are on, um, and for a lot of businesses, if they don't if they don't get on board, um, they're going to find themselves falling behind not only not only financially um, but also from a talent perspective as well. Thanks, Josh. Jane. Um, my suggestion goes to your question actually, which is about building belonging and connection. And I think that um, one of the most powerful things we can all do, particularly if you're someone like me who comes from an Anglo-Celtic cultural background, is look to build connections uh, with people uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. And that is step outside your comfort zone and connect with, um, and with someone who's different from a different cultural background to your own because we all have affinity bias and our natural predisposition is to default to people like me and so we need to, each of us, make a conscious effort to do that. And for those of you who are leaders in the room, I'd encourage you to think about the plus one pledge, which is where you think about who are your protégés and have you got a protégé who is from a cultural background different to your own? That's the first question. And the second question is, what have you done for that protégé in the last six months? How many important influential introductions have you made? How many important client engagements or projects have you got them on board to? Um, so they're the two things that I'd suggest. Um, okay. Really simply, if you're going to enact participate in any diversity and inclusive practices and programs, make sure that you have people of diversity included at the centre of that decision making. Not as an afterthought, not after the function, don't invite them to the launch. Make sure they're embedded in what you do because that will make it sustainable and not tokenistic. Thanks, Tasman. Ladies and gentlemen, unfortunately that's all we have time for, for this part of uh, this afternoon. Can I ask you to join me in thanking our panel members, um, Michaela Jeffries, Dr. Griffin, Dr. Jeremy and Tasman Chopra.